Perhaps um, after Philip's reminder about um, offering time to God, you'd like to join me in just saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm as you know, not now uh, a full-time academic, or not even a full-time amateur scholar, um, and I'm not an expert on money. So what I'm really bringing you is a theologian and philosopher's outsider's view um, on what's obviously a complex debate, just in the hope that raising some very basic questions um, might offer some people who are much more expert ways of suggesting answers. I'm very, very grateful to Timothy um, for inviting me to do this. Uh, when he first asked me, I, I thought, you're not getting, asking the right person. But actually, as um, some of you will, will have had the experience, to be asked to talk about something, um, an area that you're not expert in, can be um, a great journey of discovery, at least for the speaker. Um, and I've really, really enjoyed the process of discovery. And I hope I can share some of that excitement with you, um, albeit with the health warnings about expertise. And I'd like to thank Philip very much also um, for giving a talk that really... Um, set up uh, the sorts of things I, I like to say very beautifully. I'm also going to explain why you've got blank screens. Uh, James said, did I want um, to use PowerPoint? And I thought, well, I'm going to talk about being green. So if I'm going to talk about being green, I'll try and reduce my energy use as much as possible. <laughs> and usually I, I tend to use PowerPoint for pictures, which are meant to help people remember the different points I'm trying to make. Um, and I thought, well, they're a very bright audience. They can imagine the pictures for themselves. So the first section, um, I want you to just imagine St. Pete's, the, the audience hall at St. Peter's with the solar panels on it, okay? Just, just, just have a picture of that in your mind. That's your PowerPoint. Because I want to talk a little bit about what you might call a paradigm shift. Um, about 30 years ago, when I first knew Richard, um, and I was a student in Cambridge, I used to walk round with a badge on that said Christian Ecology Link. And I was being slightly provocative because I knew that all the Christians would complain about um, the fact that Greens were pagans and all the Greens would complain about the fact that Christians were reactionary and not interested in the environment and everybody else would complain about the fact that I was both a believer and a Green because um, neither of those were very popular. And a little bit after that, I wrote a CTS pamphlet called Must Catholics Be Green? And I did have the Pope on my side. I quoted, I, I probably included in that a, um, a very fine letter that John Paul had written in 1990 for the World Day of Peace on the ecology. But I didn't really have, appear to have much other support from the church. And at the same time as feeling that I was an outsider in both of my main interests, and particularly an outsider in combining the two of them, I was also struck by a lot of puzzles about the sorts of things we've been talking about. Wasn't it obvious that if you lent more and more and more um, people, more and more and more money to buy houses, house prices would go up? I mean, why, why, didn't, why didn't, wasn't that obvious? Wasn't there something about a world, something strange about a world in which somebody couldn't just, for instance, open a baker's shop and carry on selling bread to the local people year after year after year without having to expand or die. Wasn't there something odd about people always talking about maximising everything rather than getting the right amount? <laughs> and particularly, wasn't there something very odd about the fact that most people didn't seem to care that we were destroying all the beauties of creation around us? So... That was sort of 30 years ago and going through those 30 years. And then suddenly I woke up one fine day and discovered that actually 
the things that I'd been believing had become very fashionable. So I was able to reproduce my CTS pamphlet <laughs> with the title Catholics in Our Common Home, which of course refers to the subtitle of Laudato Si. So suddenly it was really fashionable to be green and really fashionable to be Catholic and really fashionable to be both. Um, <laughs> never trust that. <laughs> But also I realised, and this was the really exciting thing, and this is the thing that I've had time, um, thanks to, to Timothy, to think about in the last few months, that lots of other people with much better equipment than me had also been puzzling about questions about mortgages and maximising and so on. And suddenly there's a whole professional group of economists producing really sensible new ideas which make sense. They're not quite mainstream, but they seem to be shifting towards mainstream. And that's where I'm going to locate my hope. So let's start with a definition of hope. Because I'm talking about hope and money. And where better, well, I have to do this really because I'm doing it for Dominicans, so we have to have Aquinas' definition of hope. <laughs> Desire for a future good that is possible but difficult to achieve, in brackets, theological hope, with the help of God. Say that again. Desire for a future good that is possible, but difficult to achieve with the help of God, if you're talking about theological hope. I've been thinking about that definition for many years and I've never come up with a better one. So, is there any hope from our economic and financial system. Let's not underestimate the problems. We've touched on the problems. We could have lecture after lecture after lecture to spell them out. We have a really, really serious crisis about the environment. And don't let people tell you it's anything to do with climate change. Even if it wasn't, there wasn't climate change, we'd still have multiple serious um, crises concerning our environment. We've got crises in politics, obviously. We've not seen this in the last two weeks, but we've got it across the world. We've got m major instability in the economic system. We've got really serious social crises. Um, Rebecca touched on those in her question earlier. We've got a crisis of, of working lives, and that's sometimes neglected. We've got instability, lack of meaning, unemployment, um, excessive hard work and, and so on and we've got a, a major crisis in how we organise our working lives, our personal lives, leaving aside things like family breakdown, um, think about statistics for increase in teenage mental health problems and even children's mental health problems, there's something really really wrong with the society when those sorts of issues are being <coughs> flagged up. So a set of maybe interlocking crises, and underlying this, I would suggest, a crisis about spiritual life. And I want to try and identify ways in which money might be a very significant, if not even a primary source, of a lot of these problems. Philip ended by quoting, you cannot serve both God and money. And I want to suggest that it's the idolising of mammon that has led to many of these problems. Most significantly, perhaps, in the use of economic growth, which we've already been talking about, as the basic criterion of social well-being. Now, lots of economists have explained What's wrong with that? For instance, if 100 people spend three hours digging a hole and get paid for it, and then they spend another three hours putting all the soil back in again and get paid for it, we get growth. <laughs> if there are divorces, if there are oil spills, if there are car crashes, we get growth. But growth doesn't take into account the hours spent mothers looking after children, for example all of wonderfully valuable financial work. But above all, the limits that the ecology places on us are not compatible 
with continued and excessive growth. And I think the biggest problem with the question we were talking before about um, usury and creation of debt and so on is that it's pushing us towards believing that we need continued growth. Now, a lot of us know this in theory. We've heard of the décroissance movement or whatever. We know that we can't go on growing and growing and growing. But it's really, really hard to live with the right imagination. It's really hard to, li to listen to the news when it, it tells us that the stock market's gone up or, or gone down in that kind of excited or depressed voice they use mm -hmm. and not actually believe it. It's really hard not to internalise it. So are we idolising that kind of growth? Let's um, look at money again. Um, Philip's already done some philosophy. I'm going to do a bit more philosophy, if that's all right. Money is abstract, and that makes it interchangeable. Its specific qualities, therefore, are deliberately effaced, or the specific qualities of the things that you, in, you change. If I cha exchange three oranges for two apples, I lose the sense in the accounts of the specific qualities of apples and oranges. That reduces information. We do exactly the same thing with exam results, by the way. We spend hours and hours at the end of, year, of the year working out how not to pass on information to people. We do it every time we put a number in the place of a thing. But numbers, and therefore money, are also potentially infinite. So by definition, they don't recognise natural limits. But we use money to stand for limited, created things and people and animals and plants which have specific quantities, specific natures, specific qualities, specific relationships. If we constantly take our primary way of understanding these things in a way that allows us to treat them as just interchangeable and infinite, we're living on a basic falsehood, a really, really fundamental fal falsehood. I suggest that one of the reasons we might be tempted to do this is because the theoretical infinity of money mimics the true infinity of God. And we're actually made for worship we're made to respond to something that is infinite. So we're tempted to respond to something that pretends to be infinite or is superficially infinite. But creatures, as we know, are finite. Augustine loved to quote wisdom, um, the phrase in wisdom about measure, all things are made with measure, number and weight, with their own specific limits, their own specific character and nature. If we treat anything created as infinite, we engage in idolatry and ultimately we engage in madness. To want more and more and more and more of anything that's created is simply madness. In other areas, it's clearly addictive behaviour. The other thing that money does by numbering things, by replacing things by numbers, is it creates artificial possibilities of comparison. So we believe that things like cost-benefit analysis tell us truths that they don't really tell us. And it creates artificial possibilities for competition. So schools and universities and nursing homes and everything else that really matters can be ranked, artificially ranked. And the levels of social anxiety that that creates simply can't be underestimated. I've worked in a university, in a teacher training college. I've, uh, I, we, we run our own nursing home. When I was working in my teacher training college, I used to be alarmed by the numbers of stories that we heard about head teachers who'd had breakdowns just around the time of Ofsted inspections. That is because we idolise the substitution of real things for numbers. <coughs> so for lots and lots of reasons, we need to be very, very wary of 
this capacity of money to trick us into believing that we can constantly maximise and that maximising is a good thing. The economist um, Kenneth Balding said, anyone who believes that we can have infinite growth in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> And if there's just one word that I would like you to take away from this talk, it's enough. Um, really important little books on economics seem to have great titles. Small is Beautiful would be the classic. But this one, um, Enough is Enough, by Rob, Rob um, Dietz and Dan O'Neill. Um, instead of asking, can we maximise things, we need to find ways of asking, what's the right size, what's the right amount, What's the appropriate amount? What's the midpoint? What's, the appro what's, what, what's appropriate? So that's to set the problem. I want to try and find some hope to solve the problem in something that I'm calling the undergrowth movement. So at this point, if you can imagine your PowerPoint, imagine a nice picture of a wood with lots of undergrowth growing in it. But maybe to show you a little bit about the undergrowth movement, and also because at this stage in the morning you probably need a bit of a rest, um, I'm going to show you a clip from a documentary about transition towns. So you can sit back and enjoy yourself. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh. It's a blighted area by any means. Well, first thing we do in the morning is we like to go and check the abandoned houses to make sure that there's no squatters in them so it's at least safe for us to operate. We're gonna do the yellow house. 20% of the lots here are uh, boarded up or vacant lots. Hello? Hello, anybody home? Well, the good news is there's nobody in here. This is Whitney Avenue Urban Farm. There were houses here, I think, five, six years ago before they burnt down. Everything that we grow here is pretty much given away for free or donated to the food bank. People from the neighborhood also know that they're welcome to come here and pick fruits and vegetables whenever they feel like it. Well, Chris and Carly came on with me. Mainly of vacant houses and old dead lots and they beautified this whole street single-handedly. It started people appreciating what they eat. Some people on this street was hungry and they could go up to that garden and pick something to eat. We work with the kids in the neighborhood to do this. Um, basically, you know, we had a whole bunch of kids that got in a whole lot of trouble and we needed a way to keep them occupied and keep them busy and this turned out to be our way. When I first started going, I said, that's lame. It still is, kind of, but keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> we had other kids on the street that was giving Brandon a bad influence. He was following other kids that was a bad influence on him. And then, so once the kids moved away, and then Chris and Cardi gave him projects to do, he turned out to be a nice little kid. When you start picking the food from the garden, what do you do with it? Like the corn? All of it. Oh, we sold it. Oh, yeah? Where'd you sell it? Right over there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Want to take me there? Yeah. Yeah, let's go. We wait for the people to come down there. Then we ask them, do they want to buy some tomatoes or some zucchini or corn? And if they say no, we say, thank you. Have a nice day. We love the kid. He's like, he's like a son to me, you know? I want to teach him everything that he's not getting at home. What happened here in Wilkinsburg, one of the main things that the, that the downfall has been attributed to was the loss of fathers, basically. A lot of kids that are here have either their fathers are in jail, they were murdered at some point, or they've just disappeared altogether. There were gangs here, and whenever the FBI came in and disassembled the gangs, dismantled the gangs, then, you know, that meant they hauled off and threw in jail for 20 years, sometimes 60, 70 people at a clip, 
all men, most of them fathers. My goal over time would be to establish more of these types of gardens around Wilkinsburg so that people can feed themselves. This is a model, what I'm doing here, of what could be done in really every street in Wilkinsburg has at least one lot that's had a house torn down in it. You know, it's, it's ridiculously simple. And I'd like to see every, every little neighborhood in Wilkinsburg should have a little garden. In a way, I guess I am showing them sustainability, but they were not. I don't even think most of the people on the street could have told you what sustainability was two years ago. It's changed the block to where everybody else in Wilkinsburg envy our little street. Everybody wants to come to Whitney Avenue, but it's the best street in Wilkinsburg. I'm crying, you got me crying. <laughs> it makes me feel proud for, uh, to myself because when my family come around, I feel proud of where I live at. And that's changed me. So the undergrowth movement. Um, it's a mass of different small initiatives like that, that are growing up in response to environmental and social problems across the world. The nickname, my nickname, the undergrowth movement, because it hasn't got a name. It's largely unnoticed, it's undirected, it's undirectable, it's from below, it's varied, it's interconnected, it's full of life. But it's also, I think, will integrate with what the economists are doing, those economists who are questioning growth and all that goes with it. So a rejection of the economic ideal of super growth and a move towards steady state economics and all the things that go with that. And if you underestimate its importance, well, in this book, Paul Hawkin has written a book called Blessed Unrest, has estimated, well, has counted a million organisations of this size across the world. And by definition, most of them can't be counted um, as I was walking down to the station, I decided I'd walk down to the train station as I was giving a talk like this, um, rather than get a lift. Um, I walked past a new initiative about three minutes walk from where I live, which I didn't know about, which was a community orchard and garden, which has just grown up in the last year or two. It's happening all over the place. This movement is creative, decentralised, interconnected and holistic. And I want to look a little bit more at the different elements in it. Um, and then I want to try and suggest that it's got some links with the truths that we learn from Catholic social teaching and more broadly the Christian tradition and suggest that we might find some hope there. So this undergrowth movement, as I'm calling it, um, combines some or all of the following elements. First of all, ecology, the fundamental recognition we're part of the created world, we're not separated from it, we need to respect creation and live within its limits, and so we need to live more simply. It's got, um, it combines elements from politics, and I think what it does, which I think really does give hope, is it combines what's best from the traditional right, so freedom and creativity and concern for strong local communities. When we've asked why did so many people vote to leave the EU, and a lot of us have wondered about the fears that those voters had, but maybe we could flip that on our head and say what kind of hopes would have encouraged them, and I think those hopes might be in that area, but also what's best of the traditional left, care for the poor and openness to the whole world. So the goods of solidarity and subsidiarity. At the moment, the underground movement often bypasses conventional politics, um, often because it hasn't got much choice, um, but where possible it works in particular with local governments so notably, 
as far as I understand it, across the world, local governments are much better at green initiatives than national governments. But for long-term success, it'll need national and international political influence. In the economy, um, a mass of creative new ideas are being produced. So a critique of the idols of GDP and growth, proposals for different economic measures of well-being, ideas, massive ideas about different systems of money creation, including local global currencies, different ideas about business and land regulation, different ideas for f fiscal policy. There are lots and lots of ideas out there. In society, a big new recognition of the importance of relative equality for social well-being. The important book there would be the, the spirit level um, in which the authors identify the way in which financially more equal societies are actually better for rich people as well as for poor people. Um, a valuing of indig indigenous and local traditions. Bartolomé de las Casas would be pleased. Um, a regenerating of civil society through local activism and community projects of the sort we've just seen. In work, a turning away from thinking of work simply as the, for the sake of profit or status and from work that's meaningless, full, meaningless or destructive towards forms of work that are purposeful, skillful and life-giving and a, a conscious recognition of the value of unpaid work and skilled manual work. In personal morality, a commitment to living simply and joyfully. Again, think of that film we've just seen. Oh, I see you've still got half of the film up there. I don't quite know why, that why that's happened. Um, oh, anyway, never mind. Um, and a recognition that what makes us flourish is not wealth, certainly not excessive wealth, but fundamentally personal relationships, lived in community and lived unselfishly. So to sum it up, in contrast to what I think of as the <coughs> idolatrous maximising of business as usual, the undergrowth movement insists that for creatures who are by definition limited, enough is enough, and that if we recognise that and act in accordance with that, what we will find is that enough gives us joy. Now, I've described a movement without reference to the church because all these things are going on without formal recognition by the church. They're not things that are created by the church or in the name of the church. But I think that you'll see that there are strong echoes, which I just want to spell out a little bit more. Um, if I was going to have a <coughs> PowerPoint image for the next bit, it would probably be this <laughs> book, um, Ten Commandments for the Environment, which is um, summarise, summarising um, texts from Benedict the Sixteenth on environmental issues. And I think the reason that there is a strong congruence between the undergrowth movement and Catholic social teaching and more broadly the Christian tradition is because basically they're, they're both based on a sound understanding of what it is to be human. And if you really get to the core of what, what it is to be human, um, you're going to, your ideas are going to converge. So, ecology. And I'll give you a little scriptural tag for each. Psalm 150. Let everything that lives and breathes praise the Lord. <coughs> Laudato Si has reminded us what the popes have been telling us for a long time before that, that the recognition that God is creator reminds us that every creature is good, that creation as a whole is good, and that, as Laudato Si keeps saying, everything is interconnected. Politics. 
Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God's what is God's. There's a refusal of the choice between the ideological right and the ideological left, between the worship of the corp corporations and the worship of the state. Um, and something like what I think of as, as going between and beyond right and left. If you ever sit down and just read through the key doc encyclicals in Catholic social teaching from Rerum Novarum onwards, you find them sort of steering a course, um, depending on what else is going on to, in society, between reacting against excessive movements on the right and excessive movements on the left. So I think this movement is, is steering that course, but always going beyond it because of this recognition of transcendence, this recognition that there's something bigger than us and our individual concerns and our individual social concerns. And the importance of family and local communities in this movement combined with concern for all human beings fundamentally mirrors the church's concern and actually also the structure of the church. Because the Catholic Church, at least, is one of the very, very few organisations, maybe, maybe there are others, but I can't think of them, um, that have that worldwide structure of parishes, dioceses, and the universal church. Um, that interconnection, but real independence at the local level. The economy, you cannot serve both God and man. So a refusal of the assumption um, that money must be served. The economic sphere, as Benedict reminded us, is not ethically neutral. It's part and parcel of human activity. And be precisely because it's human, it must be structured and governed in an ethical manner. Society, this concern for equality, St Paul said, only they asked us to remember the poor, the preference for the poor, again, fundamentally fitting in with with central issues of Catholic social teaching. Work, think of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, a recovery of the Christian tradition of valuing purposeful work, including manual labour in human life, and personal morality. This revival of a moderate community-based asceticism which is not gloomy, but celebratory and cheerful. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness and self-control. So there are close parallels throughout between this movement and Catholic social teaching. And it's probably not a coincidence that some of the heroes and heroines of this movement, you might think of E.F. Schumacher, or Sister Dorothy Stang, um, hundreds of others, um, have been Catholics. So, does this give us hope in Aquinas' sense? Well, we're talking about the future, certainly. So remember, desire for a future good that is difficult but possible to attain. Certainly, we're talking about the future. Good. Because we reject using money with its money which is basically a cipher to stand in for limited and nameable goods but insist on asking what the goods are behind that money we can then examine them to see if they're really good and in this way we can actually see true human flourishing so we have to stop numbers obscuring what is good and stopping us asking that question a good that is difficult to obtain, I don't need to spend a lot of time on explaining why this might be difficult to obtain. I'd rather just spend a bit of time thinking about whether it's possible to obtain. It's certainly going to be very, very difficult. But I'm going to suggest that there's just a few reasons for hope. This, this movement provides the characteristics that we need for the social and economic resilience um, that we're going to need to help us through crises. It's distributed, it's interconnected, it's got a lot of variety, it's adaptive. Those are the characteristics that you need for a system to be 
resilient. It's marked by an astonishing burst of intellectual ideas which are sitting around ready for people to use and take up when we need them and when we want them. It shows an enormous practical creativity and, and courageous willingness on the part of thousands and th tens of thousands of ordinary people to put it into practice. Because the actions tend to be local and small scale, they're more manageable, so people are more helpful about trying them and getting on with them, and if they don't, if they don't work, it's not a disaster. Already an enormous amount of progress has been made in a very short time, as I've suggested from the, from the numbers of these organisations. We've already talked about this this morning, the next point, is that the money system is something that is created by our choice through legislation. It is socially constructed and actually a relatively small number of specific changes, if they're made wisely, could make dramatic improvements possible. If we can get people to rethink in a really fresh way. Truth. One of the key questions, I think, is whether the underground movement can educate ordinary people enough for them to persuade politicians to make the kind of changes that are needed. For example, Positive Money, which is an organisation looking at alternative forms of money creation, surveyed MPs not very long ago to find out how many MPs understood where, how money was created and only one in eight had even a basic understanding of it. I hope that's improved since the work of Positive Money, but it shows that actually it's not rocket science to make a real change there. With the help of God. In contrast to the dominant public voices of recent decades, the people involved with these new ideas and these new activities are very often unashamedly spiritual, often open, openly Christian, and they're often prepared to link this with their ideas and their actions. Picking up a point uh, that Philip's already touched on. People interested in these new economic ideas, these new way ways of looking at things, emphasise gratitude for what they've received. They emphasise the commons. They emphasise what we've inherited, our inherited capital, as against the idea of the individual capitalists going there alone and making all their money themselves. And they often integrate this into their proposals. For example, suggestions for for tax on uh, primary resources. Perhaps more deeply, the decentralised and undirected nature of what you might call this, this movement of movements implicitly assumes, or at least mo makes most sense with, a trust in providence. If all of us do our bit, even if it looks hopeless, then somehow it might just all to come together. It's worth trying because actually I'm not in charge, you're not in charge, even the government not, is not in charge, even the President of America is not in charge. If we all get on and do our bit, all things work together for those who love God. I've talked about the different elements of the underground movement and suggested that they're interconnected. It's fundamental to this way of thinking that it's holistic. And that links very, very closely with the language that the last three popes have introduced of integral ecology. And I think this is something that you really can't emphasise too much. Um, Benedict said it in his inaugural homily, um, 
of his papacy, the external deserts of the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. There's a constant interconnection, both negatively and positively, between all these different areas. Again, think of that little film I've just shown you. How many different aspects of life have been improved by the initiative of that, that young couple? Um, again, going back 30 years ago, the justice and peace people in the church and the green people in the church didn't really talk to each other much. It's hard to remember that now. And they said, well, you know, you can't both save gorillas and save the forests that the, the people and, and, and allow people to live in those areas that the gorillas are living in. Um, now, Greenpeace um, put forward reports about social justice. Um, the, there's, a, there's a huge integration and a coming together. And we're realising more and more and more. Think about my image of this is children walking to school. If children walk to school, they improve their mental health, they improve their physical health, they save the environment, they save money, um, they get to know their neighbours, uh, the streets are cleaner and safer for everybody. It's, it's totally in integrated. And again, I think underlying that is an assumption that because of the one creator, there is a unity of creation and a, re a mutual reinforcement of good actions in different areas. I think there might be deeper, more distinctively Christian truths here at stake also to do with the incarnation, the unity of God with creation, the sacramental nature of the material, the passion, the resurrection, self-sacrifice, hope in the midst of despair, the relationality of the Trinity, the guidance of the Spirit. But I think unpacking that would be another story. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.